Rise and Shine One Night, Thursday the 29th of January. Coming up on today's Rise and Shine Rwanda, we visit a local maize flour factory that is pushing for a healthier and more nutritional product for its consumers. Meet the CEO, a candy chat with one of the industry's top players. And Alan gives us a sneak peek of what's in theaters in this week's movie review. Good morning, it's just after 7 o'clock in the morning and you're watching Rise and Shine Rwanda with me, Regis Isheja, and over the next hour we'll bring you all the latest news, sports and lifestyle headlines from here in Rwanda and around the world. So Makeda is not here, but we're going to hold it down for her. And the Rise and Shine team are here in the studio, guys. So um, it's Thursday, what do we have in the world of the money? Well, in, in, in business news, apart from the stories that are making headlines, I have something new for the people. Something that I'm going to try to do every month is the Meet the CEO segment. Well, that's a brand new thing. Brand new thing. Brand new section. <laughs> cannot wait. All right. What do we have in lifestyle? Well, in lifestyle, it's actually Thursday, so we've got the movie review, the latest movie to go check out in theaters this weekend. Okay, and Arnold, what do you have in sports? Yesterday, your boy Rafael Nadal was out of the Australian Open. We have the whole lineup for the semi-finals. All right, all that and more still to come. But first, story of the day. Maize flour is one of the key ingredients in a lot of foods we see here in Rwanda. From kaunga, which is a type of ugali, to chapati and even beer, this product is consumed by the masses. But one company is taking an extra step to push the government's plan to sell fortified flour, which contains micronutrients like vitamins and minerals, which can help fight diseases and build healthier, stronger society. Our very own Alan Karakire went to check it out. Minimex is a maize flour factory which opened its doors back in 2006. The company buys about 100 tons of maize from farmers in the eastern province each day, which they then process, package and sell to consumer markets, institutional clients as well as exporting in the region. The, the company is in operation since uh, 2006 and uh, closing the gap between the, the farming community who are producing the maize on the one hand and the, the consumers of the population, on the other hand, who are in need of very good um, yeah, nutrition. The maize flour, which happens to be their biggest and most important product, comes in two forms. The regular maize flour or the fortified maize flour. The director says, with the help of the government, they hope that more Rwandans will be consuming the latter because of its health benefits. A fortified flour, we produce it according to the East African standard, the Rwandan standard, and it contains micronutrients. Micronutrients consist of vitamins and, uh, and minerals. So there's more iron and zinc and vitamin A and vitamin B complex. And it's actually very good for the, the population that needs it most. It is for young women, it's for pregnant women, it's for lactating women, it's for children, but it's also for the man of the family. So this is a product that we are, that we are actually pushing and trying to convince the population that having a fortified product like this really makes sense for, for the health of the family. Although the company is the largest nutritional maize company in the country, one of their biggest challenges is the smaller companies who sell their products and do not meet any of the quality standards set by the government. Having a, a certified product which meets all the quality means actually that you, you have additional costs. You know, the maize is just more, uh, is better and therefore more expensive. The whole process that you just saw uh, is, uh, is more, more expensive. And then, um, yeah, we have to be very careful uh, with the standard that we, that we actually meet. So we do it, but we meet, we face on the market products that are not meeting those standards. Some of their biggest clients include Braywa, which buys grits which is used to make beer, government institutions such as the Army, which buys the maize flour, and buy products which are sold to animal feed companies in Kenya. 
What you see here is the store for our uh, brand. The brand is the byproduct of our milling process. And uh, you can see that it is, it looks like chicken feed. Actually it is, and we sell it to the chicken farmers, but also to cattle farmers. Um, and also we sell it to companies that are making uh, complete animal feed out of this product. The director says they also have distributors who sell in the DRC, specifically in Goma and Bukavu, but they also plan on exporting into Burundi in the near future. Alan Karakir, Rise and Shine, Rwanda. And joining us in the studio is a board member of Minimex, Jean-Paul Montericanois. Welcome on the show. Thank you. Jean-Paul, I want to ask you the first question. So one thing that uh, the managing director mentioned, Mr. Claude, was that basically uh, the, the competition, or should I say the smaller companies that uh, also process maize, uh, tend to use uh, lower quality maize and at the same time, you know, sell it for much cheaper, but it's still in, in, the, in the market. And what I don't understand is why is it that it's in the market if they don't uh, meet the standards? Well, uh, to some extent, the uh, maize flour is treated like a commodity because it's uh, white, uh, it's fine, and uh, the consumer who may see it will not recognize the difference. Uh, but you have to know the whole process uh, that the maize has gone through before it's milled. Uh, in our case, whenever we buy maize, we first clean it, dry it, and uh, send it when it's ready to be milled. Whereas uh, the small millers he was talking about um, buy it, instead of drying it, they, they mill it as is. Now, when you mill it as is, there are risks of uh, maize being rotten because it has not been dried, or flour, if it takes long to, to before it's sold, it can deteriorate. Uh, now, consumers are not able to see that right after being milled because it's still white. Uh, so it's up to the enforcement authorities uh, we have to track that and uh, uh, enforce the, the, the standards. Now, piggybacking on what uh, Alan was asking, is that due to a lack of knowledge when it comes to wheat, when it comes to uh, flour, or is it just something that they're doing to make a quick buck without knowing what um, the standard is when it comes to selling it? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's mostly not knowing uh, that they have to dry it uh, before they mill it. Because uh, in, in this industry, you have to be ready, you have to, to invest. Uh, and some of them only make minimal investment to, to mill, and, but not uh, investment to first clean and dry the maize. Right. So um, they prefer to go for the very cheap investment of quickly milling the maize instead of uh, preparing it before it's being milled. And so I feel like it's also, I guess, the consumers who have to be more knowledgeable to know the difference between you know, the, the product that is you know, up to standard versus one that is just cheap but also not the best quality and also not the healthiest. Because I believe that also some of these cheaper ones tend to have uh, health uh, concerns. You might have some health issues if you consume them, is that correct? Well, th yes, there is that risk because uh, if maize has not been dried and uh, is kept for long, it rots and then it develops uh, something called aflatoxin. Now that aflatoxin uh, up to a certain level can be deadly. Uh, or can be, can be uh, damaging to the health of our consumers over a long period of time. Now consumers, most of them are not aware of that. Um, that is why, again, um, the enforcement authorities have to be the ones driving that message through the population. Now tell us a bit more about Minimix. You guys do not have uh, only Br Bradley Ryan such as customers. You're also branching out. You're uh, delivering when it comes to Bukavu, when it comes to Goma, and maybe also having your eyes on further horizons. Is that true? Yes, we, of course, Br Bradley Ryan is a valued uh, customer, one of our biggest, but uh, our biggest sales actually are for the population. We sell maize flour, which represents about 55 to 60% of our production. And uh, we sell that to 
the World Food Forum. We sell that to the Congo market, uh, Eastern Congo, Bukavu and uh, Goma. Uh, we sell to institutions like uh, schools and to other players who are aware of the benefits of a good nutrition, uh, but also benefits of uh, fortified flour. And, and the fortified flour, I think, you know, he mentioned about it, but do you think that uh, consumers know the difference between the regular maize flour versus the fortified uh, maize flour? Do you, is, is there a campaign out there for people to know the difference? Uh, there is, we, we've tried such campaign, uh, but normally it's best when uh, it's driven by a party which does not have an interest in it because uh, when I say interest, I mean economic or financial interest in it. Like private well, company. Yes, uh, it, it could be interpreted as if uh, we are just trying to, to make more profit, right. uh, whereas it's something which in other countries it's actually mandatory. In Kenya, fortifying the food, the, the flour is uh, mandatory in South Africa. Uh, so it's best when it's a sensitization driven by the government. All right, now um, here, flour in itself, because some of, of, we had someone come here on the show, for example, and talk about how they import their flour. Now, do you guys have uh, rivals here in Kigali? Is it a market that's actually booming, or do you have others importing flour uh, from overseas? For maize flour, uh, imports are very few. Uh, there used to be a lot of imports from uh, Uganda, right. uh, but over time those have faded. And uh, the competition we have right now are those small uh, millers uh, who unfortunately uh, operate in a substandard way. Uh, so it's a bit of an unfair competition, right. but those are the players uh, as far as uh, Mia's flags is concerned. Us and this morning. Jean-Paul Moutelicano, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. And uh, I'm very proud of you guys, what you're doing. As a young guy as well, I'm uh, very proud and I encourage you. Thank oh, you very thank much. Thank you very we much. Appreciate that's that. great. Thank you. <laughs> right. Appreciate that. You're watching Rise and Shine One. That's stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, you're watching Rise and Shine Ronda. Let's get to today's business news 
Fidel Scarangua has the details. Business stories making headlines today. The Rwanda Standards Board is rooting for standards issues to be included in the national school curricula to strengthen standardization and product certification culture among the Rwandans. Officials say they have already engaged the Rwanda Education Board and other stakeholders to include the subject to the curricula and are hopeful they will reach an agreement by the end of the year. They also added that this is essential to support local industry, boost competitiveness and service delivery. And oil marketer Vivo Energy, which trades in Kenya under Shell brand name, has imported the first shipment of low sulfur diesel that has less pollutants. The requirements to import low sulfur diesel arose from the treaty signed two years ago by the East African Community Member States that became effective this month. It is expected that the cost for this diesel will however be expensive for most motorists in the East African region. Now, Rwanda has had tremendous achievements over the years. Its most recent one being the commencement of direct daily flights between Entebbe and Nairobi, which will cater to the urgent demands of daily air transportation services between both cities from business and short-stay travelers. Today, in our first ever Meet the CEO segment, we meet John Mirenje, the CEO of Rwanda. can tell from uh, my short history, career history, that I've been a junk of all trades. I don't know whether I've been a master. I've been in telecoms, I've been in uh, utility, power and uh, water, I've been in industry, now at the airline. So I think, I think the, the magic is the same. Uh, it's about uh, hard work, focus, uh, just knowing the right things to do and knowing that it's all about the bottom line, it's about growth, it's about uh, making a difference. It doesn't matter where you're sitting, whether it's in a nuclear company or in a, a, food, a food or beverages company or fast moving goods, it doesn't matter. I think the, the methodology is the same. It comes back to uh, the focus that one applies. From a Rwandan perspective, I, can, I could say with confidence that uh, fares over the years have come down. The last close to five years that I've been around, I've seen fares in the region get to about half where they are today. Yes, I understand that we need to come even lower, but again, we have certain constraints on the continent, i.e. Uh, airport taxes, other fees and duties that are levied by uh, the governments where we fly. And this is very typical of the continent. So flying is still going to be a bit more expensive on the continent than elsewhere because of all the other constraints that uh, are beyond what the airlines charge. So basically, it can never be blamed on the airlines uh, entirely. Uh, part of what we charge today goes to the airport authorities, the government, form of fees, flying, overflight, landing, name it. So it's going to be a bit uh, expensive for some time. We've only been in operation probably five years as one day. Uh, we we uh, took a, a conscious decision to focus first on opening up Rwanda, making Rwanda accessible to the rest of the world so that we could attract business, tourism, conferences, name it, so that we, we, we support the, the service and hub concept that government is, is creating for the country. So this is something we're already working on. We are already talking to suppliers of planes. We are looking at a business concept, a cargo business concept that will work for us. But as of now, we're cooperating with some like-minded airlines like Ethiopian, and uh, once, once we have need, we are, already, we are always able to, to put together 
uh, a cargo, a cargo of freighter to take whatever the Rwandan community wants to export. Yes, with confidence, yes. But again, and remember those companies have been here for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. We are barely five years in the business. We are still at a phase where we're still investing and growing, we're expanding, as you've been saying. All that requires a lot of cash and uh, other resources, which will only start to return in due course. So we are not yet at that point. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little story blown out of proportions, I would say. I mean, in, in, our, in our scheme of things, what is $30,000 worth? It's very little. It's not supposed to be stolen by anybody, but it's not something that should have attracted any attention except that somebody chose to. But again, in terms of where we are today, one, the culprits have been apprehended and handed over to police. They are going through a court process. Uh, it wouldn't be in order for me to discuss the, some of the facts of the case, especially that is sub -judice. But uh, on our part as an organization, we have also learned a lesson that we need to tighten some of our controls. So we've sat through that process and uh, basically tried to streamline and uh, tighten wherever we have to so that it never happens again. One of them is, uh, is, is that level of consistency. I mean, I've been waking up at 5.30 every day of my life for the last probably 15 years and doing the same thing. I always joke about it. If anybody wanted to hurt me, it's very easy. You know where I'll be at exactly 5.30. Uh, so uh, that is one. But two is I'm a team player. I believe in everybody around me. I believe in the power and capacity that uh, pe good people bring to the, to the party. Uh, I believe in empowerment, I believe in uh, delegation, I believe in letting everybody blow up, I mean, blossom to their fullest. I've always believed that, uh, you see, poverty or wealth starts in one's mind. If you're focused, you know exactly, first of all, you just, you start with a blank paper. You draw, imagine, and draw what you want to be or how you want to succeed. Whatever you put there, as soon as you focus on it, you will get there and surpass it in no time. So just keep focused, uh, stop jumping from one pole to the other, because that is already energy wasted. So for as long as one is focused and hard working, you can never fail to succeed. John Morenje there gracing us with his presence on our first ever uh, Smith the CEO segment on the show. Well, you're up to date with today's business headlines. Sports is coming up next in just a minute with Arnold Quizera.
Welcome back to Rise and Shine Rwanda. Time now for your sports news. I'm an old Quizera. Starting with the Paralympic sport, the National Seedball Championships are scheduled for next month according to a statement from the National Paralympic Body yesterday. The tournament is slated for February 21st to March 15th and will be played under five zones, namely North, South, Eastern, Western and the city of Kigali, with the top two teams from each zone meeting up in the semi-finals slated for May 16th to 17th in Rubavu districts. Five finals will take place at Amahoro Gymnasium on June 6th and 7th. Gisagara and Gichumbi Seedball Clubs are the reigning champions in the men and women's categories. In a rather interesting development, former World Player of the Year and Portugal International Luis Figo has announced his intention to run for the presidency of the Federation of International Football Association, FIFA. Figo is the second high-profile former player to enter the race after David Ginola declared his intention to run earlier in the month. Although the former Newcastle winger is yet to secure the support of five federations, Figo's standing means there should be now at least four candidates in the contest after nominations closed on Friday. As well as incumbent, incumbent President Seb Blatter and Figo, Jordan's Prince Ali bin Al Hussein and Dutch FA President Michael Van Prague are standing. The lineup for the year's first Grand Slam semi finals is complete for both the men's and women's draws after victories for both world number ones, Serena Williams and Novak Djokovic. Serbian Novak Djokovic put up a masterclass performance as he dispelled Canadian Milos Raonic 7 6 6 4 6 2 in two hours to set up a repeat of last year's semi final against defending champion Stanislas Warinka. In the women's draw, Venus Williams' fairy tale run was brought to a halt by fellow American Keys as the 19 year old defeated her idol in three sets, winning 6 3, 4 6, 6 4. But there was good news for the Williams family as Serena went through her game in just over an hour, winning 6 2, 6 2. All right, let's start uh, with the FIFA presidency race. Mm -hmm. um, Sip Blatter, the Swiss, has been uh, in place for God knows how long. <laughs> and now you have, not only does he have competition, because usually at times he's fighting himself, it yeah. feels like, and he has the support of a lot of federations. Yep. Not only does he have uh, competition, it's former players who were very loved as players. Yeah, but uh, still, you it will be very hard for these players to you know to win the FIFA presidency. You believe that? Yeah, when you look at David Ginola, former Tottenham and Newcastle, he has not yet gotten five federations to back him up. That's a tough one. Yeah, and then you have uh, the other candidate coming, the Dutch uh, presidency. But uh, one thing that should should uh, bring more light to football lovers out there is the whole of Europe is what it's trying to stand against. Um, uh, against Seb Blatter. They need change. I think it's high time FIFA got change. We've, so many people have campaigned for change in so many uh, different political circles. FIFA has had the same leader for the past 30 plus years in Seb Blatter. And people feel it's time to change. Now when you look at Luis Figo, um, he won't, I don't think he will shake Seb Blatter. He doesn't have the financial muscle too. Um, when everyone's talking about how deep rooted corruption is in FIFA and uh, you saw the person who kind of gave Seb Blatter a scare was uh, the former Qatari Football Association, Association president who was later banned from the game, who put in a lot of money to try and have Seb Blatter. And we have so many questions about how quickly World Cups are given to different countries. Look at the way the World Cup was given That's to That's the question Russia. I was going to ask you because yeah. uh, Diego Maradona made a mm. great comment not too long ago talking about how when FIFA was run by Joao Avalanche, who's uh, the Brazilian that was in charge before Sepp Blatter, mm. that it was less scandals, that it was less problems happening, especially with distributions, like how they will um, basically give World Cup to countries and everything. You mm. really had to deserve it. Yeah. And now there's a feeling that, you know, you have some oil, you have some money, you might get the World Cup. What do you think about that? Uh, I think uh, it's so financial. There, is, there are a lot of gains for uh, in football circles. When we start with uh, UEFA itself, uh, current President Platini, uh, the deal for the national anthem of UEFA right. was given to uh, a husband of his daughter, you know. <laughs> the Heineken. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, the, you know, those, you, you look at such deals and you, you question so many right. of them. Right. When you look at um, 
the money that comes into football. I think uh, Seb Blatter's strategy that has kept him in place is to feed off the smaller continents, right. South America, Africa, Asia. And how has he done this? By giving them the World Cups. We saw the first ever World Cup in Asia. So these countries feel grateful, the first ever World Cup in Africa. So they feel like they have to vote for they him. Feel they feel they have to they vote they may for not him. agree with what he's doing. Yes, we, you remember a time when we had Issa Hayatu, the Absolutely. Uh, CAF go, president, CAF president the going on against Seb Blatter. Right. Seb Blatter actually got more votes in Africa than Issa Hayatu, who was the CAF president. <laughs> you know, it shows you the financial power Seb Blatter has. Absolutely. Um, FIFA is so deeply corrupt. Uh, you have so many complaints coming in from uh, the German FA, the, um, uh, the football FA, but there is never a time like this where you feel it's so threatened with so many countries threatening to pull out. You know, England being a global leader in football right. is threatening to pull out of uh, FIFA. But if are they capable of doing that? Will, will it affect their financial power? Yes, it will if they pull out. We won't be able to watch a Premier League the way we do to watch, right. and that will affect the FA. That's a stronghold uh, Seb Blatter has on FIFA. All right, let's talk about tennis. Uh, mm -hmm. First a Grand Slam of the year, the Australian Open. Mm -hmm. uh, once, one Williams sister is out, the other one is still going strong. Mm -hmm. Semi-finals, you think uh, the world number one, Serena Williams, is going all the way? I think so. It's, it's Serena's to lose from here. Maybe Maria Sharapova, but when you notice Maria Sharapova never beat Serena Williams in a Grand Slam tournament. Right. You know, uh, and uh, Maria Sharapova, we're going to have an all-American, uh, we're going to have an American versus Russian, as we had talked about uh, on the show earlier. Um, Keys, the 19-year-old Keys, I think Serena will be too she's powerful. She's pretty good. She's, yeah. she's um, uh, Venice Williams is her idol, yeah. was her idol growing up. Yeah, well, there, there are these new uh, young children coming on the block, uh, Kigiosis in the men's categories. Right, right. Uh, but then you have Keys, and then we had uh, Solange, the other American, Stefan Solange, the other American, uh, she, she had a fabulous year last year, but uh, coming into the Australian and open she was knocked out in the second round these young guns are proving to be some good players right. but serena williams is proving to be too strong and i think venus williams would have been right there with serena if she didn't have her health problems because uh, she was diagnosed uh, with that disease uh the the a disease that uh the syndrome that uh affects her being able to play for a long time so you have uh matches elapsing for six sorry for three to four hours and she can't keep up she's really good in three the first two matches sets. yeah right and she can't really keep up with uh, the longevity of, of the game. That's, I think, what's affecting Venus. With Serena Williams, she's too strong for the rest of the female players out there. And I think it's going to be a final between Maria Sharapova and Serena Williams in the women's category. Before we run out of time on the men's, in the men's category, uh, do you think um, Novak Djokovic playing Stanislas Wawrinka is a final before, before the that final? That is the final before the final, definitely. Uh, Stan Wawrinka versus Novak Djokovic. I think the winner of that game will go on to lift uh, the Australian Open. I don't think Andy Murray or Thomas Badic is I good enough. Yeah, if Andy Murray makes the final, then definitely the winner. Maybe Thomas Badic can give us a few questions because he's a big serving player, but... I think the winner will definitely come from Stan Warinka versus Novak Djokovic. Thank you very much, Arnold. Thanks, that was Regis. great. You're watching Rise and Shine Randa. We'll be right back after the break.
Welcome back, you're watching Rise and Shine Rwanda. Let's take a look at news making headlines here in Rwanda and around the world. The government and the American technology company Oracle have signed an agreement to enhance the skills of the ICT workforce in the country. Oracle is expected to establish learning centers as well as provide software, curriculum, technology and certification resources to students across the country. Officials say the collaboration was an opportunity to widen the scope of technology in Rwanda's education sector. The move is hoped to assist the government achieve its Vision 2020 goals in human resource development and ICT. A rehabilitation center by the Rana National Police and the Ministries of Health and Gender and Promotion is set to be launched in Huye District. The Isaenje Rehabilitation Center is expected to use a multidisciplinary approach to improve the lives of individuals living with the effects of drug and alcohol addiction. Officials say the center will also serve as a regional forensic and medical center providing comprehensive care to the patients. The facility is said to be the first of its kind in the country and is expected to serve as a reference facility for cases related to alcohol and drug addiction. Residents of Huye District should expect to see an increase in coffee harvest following the extension of the Maraba coffee program. This is expected to help generate more revenue for farmers increase productivity, raise household incomes, and improve the quality of local coffee. Officials say the program will be aimed at growing coffee on at least 2,000 hectares with the hope of boosting both the quality and quantity of coffee produced. So far, over 1,500 hectares have been planted and the remaining area will be planted in the next fiscal year. And in regional news, South Sudanese militia have freed over 250 child soldiers as part of a wider deal to release about 3,000 underage fighters. This comes after UNICEF negotiated the children's release who were recruited into an armed group which has now made peace with the government. The UN agency said that more than 10,000 children were forcefully recruited by armed groups in South Sudan over the past year. More releases are expected to occur in the coming weeks. All right, lots more still to come. We take a look at what's hot right now in our daily debate section, Hot Topics. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching Rising Shine Ronda. Time for lifestyle. Alan, what do mm -hmm. you have for us? Well, today is movie review, as every Thursday. Life every day. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be checking out what's 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 playing in movie theaters. Plus the cult classic, as always. All right. All right, so this week we have a great movie that's coming out. It's actually one of these biggest movies playing in theaters all over the world. Right. I'll let you guys, I'll let you see the trailer. I'm, right. used, to, I'm used to talking to you and Makeda. Oh, so it's yes, weird. yes. But let's check out the trailer. Okay. I got a military age male uh, on a cell phone watching the convoy over. If you think he's reporting troop movement, you have a green light. Your call, over. Maybe he's just calling his old lady. <laughs> Hold on, I got a woman and a kid 200 yards out moving towards the convoy. Her arms aren't swinging, she's carrying something. Yeah, she's got a grenade. She's got an RKG Russian grenade. She's saying to the kid. You say a woman and a kid? You got eyes on this? Can you confirm? Negative. Your call. And they fry you if you're wrong. That I cannot wait to see. I mean, you have action. And then you can tell that there's a backstory to the whole thing, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It stars Bradley Cooper, as you saw. Directed by Clint Eastwood. By Clint Eastwood. And it, it's just a movie. You know, in America, it was quite controversial because, you know, some people, you know, were saying how... Uh, it doesn't really depict how it really is on well, film. Well, not even just that, but the, there was controversy between, you know, politicians saying that, you know, uh, snipers, you know, do a great job, whereas others are saying they're cowards because they shoot people when you know, they're not looking or, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it, it was controversial in America, but as far as the movie itself, it's been a big hit and it, a lot of people are talking about it. When it's does huge. it open in Kigali? So it's out in theaters tomorrow and okay. you can go check it out. And okay. I'm sure you will, right? I can, I'll be there, for, I'll be there tomorrow, believe <laughs> that. All right, so I think it's your favorite uh, part. Yes, I feel like I wish I had a condom or something. <laughs> All right, so the cult classic of the week, let's check it out and I'll talk okay. about it. Bill said he used to be with the Secret Service. There was two years with Carter, four with Reagan. Reagan got shot. Not on my ship. All my colors for you. All right. You don't look like a bodyguard. This is my disguise. <laughs> well, his timing's good. Henry, I've spent a lot of time guarding people all over the world, and I found one thing to be true. No matter how incompetent the assassins, no matter how much they miss their target, Why? there's one person who always gets hit. Who? The cocky black chauffeur. You afraid I might get picked off my snazzy run suit? No, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to jog with you. Someone was in my house? <laughs> Wait a minute, someone was in my house? Everybody's afraid of something. That's how we know we care about things. When we're afraid we'll lose it. Man. Isn't that a classic? What year was that? 1992. Yes, and yeah. that's right on the heels of uh, I Will Always Love You or before I Will Always Love You? It was exactly when, because uh, yeah, that movie actually came out. The, it was on the soundtrack, on soundtrack of, of The movie. Bodyguard. And which actually funny you mentioned that because the soundtrack was the biggest selling soundtrack in of the 90s. Time, right? Of all time, of in all time, the 90s yes. until another one came and snatched it. But uh, what I love about this movie, well, first of all, it stars the late... 
Whitney Houston. But it's a great love story, and it's just one of those movies I believe you know we all watched as a kid. It's right? one of those duels you actually believe the on-screen chemistry there. Because remember when she passed? Um, I don't remember if you. I don't he, know if you watched the eulogy, but he, he was read, there absolutely, yeah. and it was very touching the way he read it. You could tell that they had a chemistry. They had something going on there. You know what? I I remember as a kid, used to, I used to think, why aren't they actually together? Because I remember after she married. We Bobby all Rod. we all thought <laughs> that because you you feel like it's real. That's when you believe. The, that's when the chemistry is the great. The chemistry is real, right. right? Exactly. So just before we wrap up, as every week, we give out free movie tickets. So this week's movie trivia question is. Who originally sang the hit song, I Will Always Love You? Is it A, Whitney Houston, B, Diana Ross, or C, Dolly Parton? So again, the original person who sang the hit song, I Will Always Love You, send us your answer, and you could, with, either on Facebook, on Twitter, or by email, and you could win two tickets to check out the latest movie playing in theaters. All right, stay tuned. Hot Topics is coming right up. Welcome back, it's that Hot Topics time again. As always, you can join in on the debates through our social media, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter. Let's get into our first Hot Topic, guys. So, in England, uh, they, in England, the Church of England actually recently named the first female bishop, very first female bishop. Her name is um, Libby Lane, if I say it correctly, and she's a 48-year-old woman who basically was, first of all, a lot of people attended, there was about 2,000 people who attended the ceremony when she was, you know, named Maybe officially ordained. as a, ordained, thank you, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> but there was also, there was also some, some uh, very religious conservative people who were there who didn't think that, it, who thought that it was against the Bible to have a female bishop. But of course, you know, the, the person who was actually um, leading the, the ceremony said, Bishop the the, exactly was like there's nowhere in the law that says that she cannot be a bishop mm -hmm. now what do you guys think about that I love it me, of I, course you, you love it of course I love it because I'm, I'm all about women taking over the world so for me <laughs> this, is, this is a win win I, I love it you meant empowerment <laughs> or taking over the world take over like wow. complete take over alright <laughs> Arnold what do you think about it I all? think it has been pending for a while uh, she requested for her supposed to be ordained uh, back in about 2008 2009 and that's when uh, this new uh, Archbishop of Canterbury the head of the Protestants church Anglican right. churches around the world was just uh, he had just also been ordained that's Bishop William St. Tom as the new head of the uh, but uh, unlike his previ predecessor um, uh, the former bishop of uh, head of a he was he wasn't he didn't accept uh, female bishops uh, he thought it was against the Bible but these are new ideas and we feel there is a change maybe some other churches will pick up with this right. but the Anglicans are setting uh, a step forward for religions but I, I'm asking myself how wide can this spread I mean can we have a female imam can we have uh, I think uh, everything has we a... We have to wait and see. It's a yeah. step by step yeah. It's a step by step. <laughs> but right. I'm sure it will happen. I, I have no doubt about like that. Like I say, take over. <laughs> 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 All right, on to the next hot topic. Again, this is a female story, but very different. So in Kenya, now you guys have heard about the story of, uh, you know that movie that came out, The Fourth Grade, uh, what right. is it? Fourth the Fourth grade. Grader? Yeah. Well, there's actually another pupil, but this time it's a woman, and they call her Grandma Gogo. She is a 90-year-old woman in Kenya who is actually a, a student, a pupil in primary school with about, sorry, six of her great-grandchildren in the same class. Isn't great, that great? Great, great, sorry, great, 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 great grandchildren in the same school. That's her right there, you see. And she's been in school for the last five years. She used to be a midwife before and she decided to go back to school. Although now before, the, the school did not allow her until they realized how serious she was. And she's now among uh, one of the best pupils in the school. So and the movie was called The First Grader. No, no, no. So I, I was I was talking about the original oh, okay. oldest pupil who oh, is yeah. in the Guinness World oh, Records. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But now she is actually going to beat uh, the gentleman who um, his name was actually, sorry, give me a second, 
was, was Kimani Maruge. Also uh, from Kenya. Yes, also mm -hmm. from Kenya. So he died when he was 89, but this woman is 90 years old. And she's and cool too. Did you see the, I don't know what you call it. I mean, she has a hat there, or whatever it's called. <laughs> it's, never it's, exactly. it's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. like for, for many people, like when you've not done something by a particular age, most people tend to give up and they say, you right. know what, I didn't do it. That's it, I give up. But you know, examples like this show us that it's never too late. Just never give up. Always go for what you want and you definitely get it. Just yeah, take time. And, and I like Absolutely. her name, man. Grandma Gogo. You know Gogo it's, is it's Talisha. Yeah. Grandmother. Yeah. Just grandmother, grandmother like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I must mention, you know, one mm. of the things I read in the article was that even the students appreciate her. Yeah. You know, one 11 year old girl was saying that, you know, she's her best friend because oh. she tells them stories when they're in PE. Uh, and, you know, they get to learn about culture because she, exactly. she's been a midwife for a long time. Mm -hmm. So she teaches them about culture and how things were things were like 50 years ago and yeah. beyond. So I think it's a great story and it just shows, like you say, you know, it's never too late. Never too late. All right. All right, Alan, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Don't forget, we love to hear your thoughts, comments and feedback on what we're talking about here on Rise and Shine Randa. Tweet us at Rise and Shine or W. Like us on Facebook and send us your ideas for programs. Check out our Rise and Shine YouTube page where you can catch all the shows and programs we do. Check out our Instagram, Rise and Shine RW, we'd love to see your pictures. Or check out our Rise and Shine Randa website. Well, that's the all the time we have for today. We'd love to, hear, to, give, to have your feedback, your thoughts or comments on the show. But for now, this is Rise and Shine Randa. I'm Regis Sheja on behalf of me, Makeda, who's not here, and this beautiful team that you see here. We're saying bye-bye. We'll see you tomorrow morning, same place, same, place, same time. Bye-bye.